Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael. I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Well, uh, we attended the Libertarian Party of Alabama's state convention this weekend, this past weekend. Yeah, and uh, it was a blast, man. I mean, got to say, I had a really good time. Met a lot of cool people. Yeah, have to give props to Laura too, uh, to Laura Lane, who's the chair of the LPA. Um, she put on a great convention. Actually, it's one of the smoothest. Yeah, I think this is the third one I've attended. Mm-hmm. I believe it's the third one. By far the smoothest. Yeah. I mean, by far. No, there's really no question. <laughs> Everything, uh, everything started close to on time, and everything finished early, which is a yeah. miracle at these things. <laughs> Especially when you're dealing with a bunch of libertarians, we yeah. tend to drag things out. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the semantic arguments tend to run long. Yeah, um, just a little. But uh, and the speakers were great. Uh, yeah, the whole group of speakers, all of them. And I will say this for particularly this: there was no. We didn't have any speakers that I didn't find completely, didn't get, didn't get completely enthralled with. I mean, I love them all. They all did a very good job. Yeah, um, I, I particularly liked uh, Robin Corner. Corner? Yeah. Corner? I don't know how to say his last name, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that uh, Jacob something burger. Ah, Dang yeah, it. the guy that's running for president. Hornberger, right? Hornberger, yeah. yeah. Uh, I keep, Jacob I keep Hornberger. murdering his name. He was really interesting. I'm, yeah. I'm glad that we tracked him down before he left town. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it was really interesting talking to him, um, privately and at length, yeah. uh, where it was a dialogue instead of him just talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that was certainly worthwhile, and of course the. You know, the highlight, as far as I'm concerned, was uh, Scott Horton. Without um, question. The great Scott Horton. <laughs> yeah, the inimitable Scott yes. Horton. And we have uh, quite a treat for you um, here. Uh, we did manage to sit down uh, with an interview with Scott Horton. Um, we had him for, I don't know, half an hour, maybe, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, pretty much. And close, uh, yeah. now, <laughs> I will warn you a couple of things in advance. Uh, this is the first time that we've pulled our audio out into the real world, uh, not into the nice controlled environment of my office. Um, and uh, so we were recording from uh, picnic tables in a um, in the courtyard of the Clarion Inn and Suites in Auburn. Yeah. Uh, as a side note, I do not recommend booking a room at the Clarion Inn and Suites <laughs> at Auburn. But uh, they did have a nice courtyard and a nice little um, kind of, uh, you know, protected setup where we could put things down at the picnic tables there. Um, It it was actually a nice little environment to do the recording. But you do get uh, a lot of extra noises. And I swear when Scott starts talking about uh, Afghan, um, the Afghan war... That's, That's not gunshots going yeah, off. It, it's no, doors shutting. It was not a sniper. Uh, Scott is fine. Um, yes, it was uh, doors slamming, uh, not gunshots. And But uh, the kids you hear screaming, uh, yeah. they are, in fact, kids screaming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Absolutely. sorry those, about that. Those are not effects we added in later. In addition, um, we did have a problem with uh, one of the microphones uh, losing signal for a few minutes. I have gone back through and boosted, and unfortunately it was Scott's microphone. Um, <laughs> I did go back through and boost uh, what we could pick up of Scott from mine and uh, Liberty Larry's microphones as best I could. Uh, I think you'll notice a difference, but it's it's there. It's and it still comes in clear. It's yeah. I mean you'll notice a difference, but it's not it's not bad. And we didn't we didn't want to lose all that. That would have been that would have been a disaster. So. Um, I guess without uh, the, it is our pleasure to introduce Scott Horton here, and um, you. I, I hope that you enjoy this as much as we enjoyed doing it. And I, I'll tell you, for me, well, we'll get back to it afterwards. We'll uh, okay. stick around after the interview. There will be a little bit more from from me and and Larry. Um. Well, anyway, I got a million of them. <laughs> do this all day, right? That's right. I'm yeah. gonna be here through so, Tuesday. Like I was seriously really nervous about this interview, and I was like, "Well, but I've listened to this guy. The truth is, all we got to do is get him talking. He, he can talk for 20 minutes. We, we can just let him go. Nothing to be It'll nervous. Be perfectly fascinating. Hey, Scott, and what's fine. bothering you this week? 
Um, well, uh, no, you can ask specific things. That's probably better. So uh, I, you know, I've been following you for a long time. I'm like really excited about having this interview. And uh, so here we have you know, Scott Horton, who is really nice to the, meet you. the premier uh, foreign policy libertarian guy. And we're really happy to have you here. Um, now you have uh, scotthorton.org where you have almost 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, mostly on foreign policy, right? Yep. And, uh, and the libertarianinstitute.org. Um, I couldn't find your, your uh, title or your relation to that, but I know that you're, you're deeply I'm involved. the director. Okay. Yeah. And Me then, and Sheldon Richmond is my partner, the heroic Sheldon Richmond. Yeah, with that every Friday interview, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and then uh, antiwar.com, where you're the editorial direct director, and I spend a tremendous amount of time. Good. Um, and, uh, That's and what I want to hear. Try and recommend everybody else do the same. So uh, I was actually going to try and avoid foreign policy as much as possible here um, okay. because there's so much of you talking on foreign policy out there. It's available, and I recommend everybody that's listening just track down Scott Horton. Just put his name into YouTube. You'll find plenty. There's some stuff. Um, so uh, since that's everywhere, I was hoping that we could maybe find out a little bit more about you in, in other areas. Um, and the thing that I've always been most impressed since I've been following you is uh, just the amount of productivity, like all the content that you put out there day after day. So I have no idea how you do it. And uh, so I'm just curious, what is a typical day in the life of Scott Horton? Oh, it's just me chained to a desk, essentially, <laughs> uh, just like everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mostly I start off reading articles for antiwar.com, so I have my list of everything i got to go through looking for viewpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, and I give the thumbs up or thumbs down on all the viewpoints for the site there. And that really takes the better part of the morning, depending mm -hmm. on exactly how much i got to read. Mm -hmm. And then right now I'm working on a new book, so I'm, I tried to put all the interviews on and do, record them all on Fridays only and spend the rest of the week uh, working on the book which is not necessarily working out that well, but, mm. and I've had in just absolutely unbelievable internet problems for the last four weeks straight, which is finally resolved, but the sites were down and my mm -hmm. own access to the internet was completely down. I was going to say, because so, we weren't really seeing yeah. any content for yeah, a little no, while there. No new shows for four weeks, but it's not like yeah. I was getting books read either, because I was just sitting there cussing and working, <laughs> trying to resolve yeah. the problem that wouldn't resolve with mm -hmm. the thing, which is finally fixed now. Yeah, um, and I'm happy to report it. the problem was not just that I'm an idiot. Like it took <laughs> the very most sophisticated server genius dudes to rescue the thing. So All right. it is what it is. But um, mm. but yeah, I'm, I'm working on a new book, and it's going to be called "God Dang It, Bobby: Time to End the War on Terrorism." But that's not it, actually. But something like <laughs> working that. title. Yeah, working, <laughs> working title. title. <laughs> and it's going to be about all the wars. It's going to be, you know, Fool's Errand, the, the Afghanistan book, started as chapter two. Mm -hmm. and then, But chapter one was already getting into this mess. The Carter through Clinton was already way too long anyway. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what I was going to do with that. But I went ahead and moved on to Afghanistan. And then that was way too long. So I just said, oh, what the hell, I'll finish and just do an Afghanistan book. Mm -hmm. But so this is the book that Fool's Errand started out as, mm -hmm. which is basically Jimmy Carter through right now and all the Middle East wars and, wow. and the war on terrorism. Yeah. But hopefully like a very brief and easy version of each mm -hmm. one of the ones, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not going to completely inundate you, but I want you to understand the Somalia situation by the time you're done with that one and go through. There's like eight or ten. Right. Or so. Well, that's one of my favorite stories of how a book got written, by the way, is when I, I first heard you say, uh, well, you know, how did, how did uh, the... Um, the Afghanistan book get written. You said, well, I started writing a book on, on the terror war and I got stuck on chapter two. <laughs> yeah, I got <laughs> bogged down in the Afghan quagmire mm -hmm. like so many before me. Yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, are you a member of the LP? No. Okay. I never have been, I don't think. Um, I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry I, Brown was, you know, a real big influence on me back, yeah. you know, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I think I decided like in the, in the early 2000s that I would just rather focus on more like movement type stuff rather than the organizational type thing. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not best spending my time collecting petition signatures and whatever for, uh -oh. for yeah. railroad commissioner races when I got mm -hmm. you know, other bigger fish to fry. But um, I, obviously I think it's hugely important. That's going to be part of my talk tonight is just how hugely important I think the LP is and could be and should be and, and all of those things. So you got to get in on this too, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm the quiet guy, man. I'm the quiet yeah, I told guy him on the also podcast. Come up for, the quiet guy on the podcast. For, I know, right? For Scott Horton, like you got to have some questions for Scott Horton. 
Um, if well, I don't have an answer, I'll make one up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, let's see. Uh, do you vote? No. The, the last time I voted was in the primaries for Ron Paul in 2012 and in 08. I don't know if I voted in the general in 08. I might have. But I quit voting before that, but Ron Paul's Ron Paul. Yeah, so it's but not yeah. a, I, I won't participate in the political process, just I won't participate unless there's somebody worth getting behind. Yeah, I mean, if, if there was a real exception, I thought it was really worth it just to make a statement kind of thing. But mostly I think it's a waste of time. Um, yeah. I think, you know, the Libertarian Party, and I know that this has been brought up before, it's an original idea of mine, but I've brought it up and I've had people tell me that lots of people have thought of that before. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like the obvious thing would be, like, I have no idea how you guys do it here, but like in Texas, they run somebody for every House seat, every Senate seat, Railroad Commissioner, Land Commissioner, Attorney General, and Governor, mm -hmm. and everything. But why not run one or two guys for a couple of seats where you might actually have a shot, especially if you're talking like the state house of representatives, kind yeah. of focus your there energy. might be a district yeah. where you could actually get yourself a seat mm -hmm. if you could get everybody who's running for 10 different seats to all just work together to help this one guy, mm -hmm. especially in a state the size of Texas. That's a lot of Libertarian Party members right. from a lot of big cities. Yeah. You know, they could kind of organize that. What about actually getting a guy elected to the U.S. House? And, you know, this is the miracle of the U.S. Constitution, if there is one at all. It's that here's this national office where the men are elected, 435 of them, from these tiny little districts. Mm -hmm. A tiny little local election for a national office. Why are we doing anything but run for the U.S. House of Representatives and get some libertarians in there with the word libertarian behind their name mm -hmm. and get them up there raising hell in Ron Paul's old poll position, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and instead it's, you know, I said that at a meeting in Texas and they're just like, but I'm running for railroad commissioner, so screw you, dude. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, but you're... That's great for you, you know, but we should yeah. focus some of this energy on some, in some... And it's easy area. for me to say, because yeah. as I said, I'm not really a party guy and I don't work this stuff. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just looking at it from the outside, yeah. but it's well, like, And it's hard you know. for us here in Alabama. Ballot access is a true challenge. That's the yeah. real reason for, for it, to, right? Yeah. Is they make yeah. you run for everything, yeah. you know, and all that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I agree with you mostly. We only ran four or five candidates in the state um, in this last election cycle. And, yeah. uh, and I ran for Board of Education in my county. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, I wish I had taken all the time that I put into my own campaign and put it into to Matt Shelby's campaign that was running for state house mm -hmm. um, and just accumulated just a few more percentage. Uh, I, I think that we could have, you know, just gotten a few more voters. Of course, here we get like probably, well, certainly in our county, two thirds of the votes cast were straight ticket. Right. Votes. So. I mean, look, the whole this is the worst part of the Constitution from mm -hmm. our point of view mm -hmm. is that. It's 51% winner take all. Yeah. yeah. So we already have these left and right coalitions called the Republicans and the Democrats, and they already each have a just about 50% shot at each race. Mm -hmm. So the Libertarians' position in the race, there are going to be unique races where the Republican retired, the Democrat has no chance in hell, yeah. and the new Republican is a real dweeb, yeah. and the Libertarian actually is a doctor from that town or mm -hmm. somebody who is actually, you know, really worth it. Yeah. Now it's like a, a confluence of, of some stars align and make it possible for us to get in the door, mm -hmm. get one good guy in there, and then imagine the damage that, in a good way I mean, that yeah. one real Libertarian with the Libertarian Party brand name mm -hmm. in the Alabama State House yeah. could do. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think, you know, I'm throwing a stranger under the bus and I don't know his name, so I can't hurt him too bad. But it was a Texas Libertarian who was running against Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke in the okay. last Senate race. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw him, he gave a talk and he goes, so guess what, everybody? I'm polling within the margin of error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exciting. And so, yeah. And so what that means is that no matter who wins, I'll be able to take credit for hurting the other guy. <laughs> and then, from now on, the Republicans and the Democrats will have to run libertarian-type people that we'll like so that we won't do that to them anymore. <laughs> How's that working out? And then the audience <laughs> said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to us, too. Yeah. Uh, no. And then, so, but here's the thing about it, is that there actually is a kernel of truth to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is what That's if true. in that race, 
he had run strictly against Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. What if he had not said, I'm a libertarian and I'm equally running against each of these guys? What if they had gotten the most right-wing kind of conservative-seeming libertarian mm -hmm. in the party that they could? And then they ran him against Cruz yeah. and said, Cruz hates the Constitution. Cruz is, sucks on this. Cruz sucks on that. He calls himself America first. He supported the war in Libya. Blah, da, 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 da. And yeah. nail Cruz. It may not work, but guess what? If the Democrat had won... Mm -hmm. after the libertarian had made a fuss like that, yeah. then he would at least have a claim on claiming credit, yeah. right. right? You would at least have to hear him out that, hey, it's because yeah. of me. I beat Ted Cruz. And then at least hypothetically you could say to the Republicans, this is what happens when your candidates are too right-wing and not yeah, libertarian enough, which is still never going to change the Republicans, right. but at least but the, it, at least the narrative it. would make sense that way, yeah. right? If you, if you took, or take John McCain mm -hmm. in, in Arizona, what if the Libertarian shiver. Party, what if the, the Libertarian name. Party had spent the last 20 years running the most right-wing Libertarians that they could in the Senate races mm -hmm. against McCain and the general yeah. to try to hurt him and give it to the Democrat? And what if they just ran and just said, we're doing this because he's the worst warmonger in the Senate. We're doing this on behalf of the rest of the nation. We're yeah. going to take John McCain out of the U.S. Senate because the rest of America doesn't want him. And so, and then, and also John McCain was absolutely horrible on everything. So all they had to do was just be good and <laughs> honest and educated and thorough, right? And go through the case against him. And then what if they actually had done it? What if, what if they had, a Democrat had beaten McCain and the Libertarian got the margin, mm -hmm. and the Libertarian made it a point to leave the Democrat alone and really try to hurt him. Focus mm -hmm. on, yep. That would be something we could claim some credit for. That would be yeah. something tangible. Yeah. This guy is going, look, if I just show up, then no matter who wins, I get to claim I'm the reason he wins. But that's not true, really. Yeah. No one is hearing that, and it doesn't amount to anything. And no one is saying, oh, well, Ted Cruz got elected. I guess the lesson is, we should run a more libertarian Democrat next time. Like, that didn't happen. That conversation didn't happen anywhere in the state of Texas after that election. It just didn't happen. Yeah. You know? It was a fantasy. For president, right. So. Yeah, and which is funny because he could have ran against Cornyn in the next Senate race. Yeah. And instead, he's skipping ahead. After losing a Senate race, he's going to run for president from the House. Yeah. The guy's a complete empty suit. That's the other thing is he would be, he'd have been easy to make fun of as well. But, right. but anyways, um, yeah, that's my thing about the Libertarian Party is there's, it seems like there's so much potential value, and, but then it seems like big opportunities wasted a lot of times for lack of vision. But then again, like you say, they got you by the ballot access and you have to jump through all of their hoops just to stay relevant for next time at all. So I know that that's right. an incredible hurdle to, to get by, but... Um, yeah. Is there a cabinet position? If miraculously I managed to skip through the, uh, um, the Board of Education and all, all that stuff and, and somehow won the presidency, is there a cabinet position that I could offer you that you would accept? Oh, yeah. Secretary of Defense. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, immediately. All right. Yeah, Excellent. we're going to close the Pentagon down. <laughs> we're going to turn it into a library just like FDR promised. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, this Pentagon, this is just temporary for the war effort. <laughs> <laughs> or you can make me the head of the CIA and I would kill all of my employees and then myself. <laughs> I'd poison them all. With style. Yeah, I'd do it. It's all sneaky. <laughs> all right, well, that's good to know. I, um, I always wonder about, uh, to me, the, I think you kind of answered the, the follow-up I had to the, the previous question, which is, um, what is the libertarian road to political influence? And I, I think that you, you made some good points there. I, um, and I appreciate, and this certainly isn't an attack on you, because yeah, there's ahead. a lot of people out there that are, uh, that are producing content, that are making a difference by you know, changing people's way of thinking about the world. But there's also a whole lot of libertarians that sit back and say, well, I refuse to take part in the political process, and they aren't putting out any content, and they aren't really changing people's minds. And it, it always irritates me, because I think how... How do you intend to make any difference? How do you tend to br uh, intend to bring about a libertarian society if you don't participate in the process and you don't want a violent revolution? Because that's only two ways that I see. Right. And yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, you, everybody's got to find their comparative advantage in the libertarian marketplace and where they can have their best effect. But um, 
you know, and, and I think it's fine for people who, um, you know, preach agorism and just, you know, ignoring the state to death as much as possible, you know, tune in and drop out of the, this system and do your farmer's market instead and all of that. Like, that's all fine, mm -hmm. too. Um, people, you know, live in libertarianism as best they can in that way. Um, yeah. And, you know, frankly, like the, the paperwork and the patience and the dealing with strangers, like on the level that libertarian party members have to do a lot of time, like I could not do that kind of work. Yeah. Like, I would way rather read about Gaza all goddamn day. Than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, I, this is how I got you. fired from every job I ever had. I don't yeah. like customers, they don't like me. So, um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think, um, but, you know, again, with the 51% with the winner-take-all thing, and the libertarian influence is on the margin. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who are right about everything, but we also have to recognize that we're about 4 or 5% of the population. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is wrong about everything, yeah. and we're not going to be able to seize power from them, and they are not going to elect us because they don't like us, because mm -hmm. they don't agree with us, because they're wrong about everything. Mm -hmm. So, the what we can really do is everything we can to win on its own, you know, for its own sake and all that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our real advantage in the marketplace is we're the ones who are right. Mm -hmm. So what we, you know, need to do, I think, is prioritize fighting and, and being the ones who are good on the issues that matter the most and then being that influence. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, I'm not going to give all the credit to the Libertarian Party or Libertarian Movement at all for this, actually, but it's sort of the analogy still holds. As you look at all the mostly left activists who mm -hmm. pushed all this time for gay marriage. And the Libertarian Party, by the way, has been good on gay marriage since, like, 1970 Forever. or whatever, yeah. since, since the very beginning. And you can't say that for a lot of leftists and liberals. Right. But essentially, it was their movement that made the difference because they got the numbers. Mm -hmm. But the deal was that the party was against it. Barack Obama was against gay marriage as recently as the other day or yeah. something, you know? And then what happened was is people kept pushing and pushing and pushing and saying, enough. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it that way anymore. We're doing it this way now. And then essentially that sort of public spirit mm -hmm. manifested through a goddamn Supreme Court decision yeah. that said that this is, you know, unfair discrimination of equal protection of the this and that by essentially rejiggering the definitions, mm -hmm. right? Um, before they would only compared one heterosexual marriage to another heterosexual marriage. But now the apples and oranges are in different carts, and so they examine the question in a different way. And that's from the popular demand. That's from the people saying enough already. And in fact, pot's the same way too. Yeah. Man, in I remember in 1992, my friend said they're going to legalize pot, and I said, "You dumb son of a bitch! George <laughs> Bush is the president of the United States right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know how that. much chance there is they're going to legalize pot?" zero and it was like six years before the first state legalized medical pot mm -hmm. after that you know in the yeah. in the mid late mid 90s in california mm -hmm. and then ever since then it's gone completely out of control i just saw a poll the other day said in 1990 13 percent wanted to legalize pot right around that same time i was having that conversation with my friend right now mm -hmm. it's more than 65 percent yeah and that's from the demand from the people who were right about this issue just fighting about it mm -hmm. and refusing to be intimidated and refusing to be, oh, you're just a stoner or you're just, you know, give in to these kinds of deflections. Mm -hmm. And I said, no way, this is wrong. You got people in, in cages for trading in pot. You've got to be kidding yeah. me. This is crazy. And so, and they're still sitting there, by the way. It's not like they all got released. But, <laughs> yeah. but that's our role in the society is saying essentially this and this and this is wrong. And the reasons for it that they say are not true. And you don't have to believe in it at all. And you don't have to support this. It's all totally wrong. This is what's right. And how do I know? So I'm a libertarian. I thought it through. Mm -hmm. This is why freedom works. Mm -hmm. And your regulatory scheme will not. Yeah. And, and we can win that fight on everything. Because we are right about everything. And they are wrong about everything. Mm -hmm. So whether it's foreign policy, welfare state, regulatory state, or any kind of state you got. Yeah. You know? Um, the advantage is ours in that, you know, I guess essentially the, the mass of the left and the right, most of their leader lists, most of their leaders are, you know, worthless, mm -hmm. don't have much to, to offer them, to give them. So we can set their agenda for them. Yeah. We just have to insist 
that, that's what we're doing. I mean, they called it the libertarian moment. Why? Because Rand Paul won an election on his father's coattails. Mm -hmm. But the reason why is because there was nobody else to contradict them. Yeah. Who, what intellectual leadership does the right wing have? Rush Limbaugh and Newt Gingrich? And, <laughs> and Newt Gingrich isn't actually smart. He just says profound and fundamental a lot. <laughs> that's profoundly <laughs> fundamental, but he actually never says anything. Yeah. So if you're a right winger, there's not, you know, there's Stephen Bannon and the Breitbart stuff and whatever, but there's not too much really to follow. Mm -hmm. Libertarians always make much more sense. Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing for the leftists, you know, if you mm -hmm. care about the poor and the disadvantaged and the this and that and whatever, what you need is capitalism, my friend, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And so we're better than the stuff that the right is good on, we're better than them, and, and the stuff the left is good on, we're better than them. Mm -hmm. So we ought to be able to corral them. That's our our yeah. job in the, in the American political scheme as I see it, you know? Well, um, running out of time here. I want to give you a little bit of time to prepare for your Now nah, I'm ready to go, man. No um, problem. So what are you talking about tonight? Uh, I'm going to talk about the wars yeah. and then a little bit along the lines of what we were just talking about, about, you know, the Libertarian Party and, yeah. and how it fits in American politics and what, what it's good for, what we can use it for. Cool. And then... Uh, I actually don't know if it's an announcement or if everybody already knows or what, but I got a little bit of an announcement I'm going to make tonight oh, too fine. to end it. So uh, right. yeah, it should be good. I think I got what, like half an hour? Yeah, I want yeah, a little bit I want to not go on too long about all the wars because there's a lot of them. There's so many. I'm going to well, try to just really yeah. kind of give you a scorecard through where we are on each one. Um, well, I thought Fool's Errand was a fantastic book. I learned Thank a you, ton um, reading that. And uh, there was, I, I heard you talking one time, just like a, a little synopsis of it, where you were saying this was an excuse we were given for war, um, refute it. And even if you accept that as truth, here's the next excuse, refute it, uh -huh. as kind of how you built the book. Right. Um, would you mind going through that uh, yeah, sure. for our listeners here? Sure. So, um yeah, and the book is written that way as well. I, I didn't really make it like bold headings or whatever, so I'm not sure if people exactly picked up on it the way I tried to do it. But essentially I tried to tell the story that they didn't have to invade Afghanistan after September 11th, that Mullah Omar and the Taliban leadership hated Osama bin Laden's guts, and they were more than happy to turn him over. All they needed was to save a little face. And George Bush said, no negotiations. We will not talk to you we will accept your unconditional surrender and your handover of these guys. And the Taliban said, look, man, give us a way to save a little face here, pal. And Bush said, no, because he wanted to attack. He wanted, and, and there were multiple offers. They started off saying, well, first prove he did it and we'll hand him over. And then they said, no, we're not gonna prove anything to you. We don't have to, we made our demands. You're gonna do what we said. So then they said, and, and that one was, give us some proof and we'll turn them over to another Muslim country. That was the first one. Mm -hmm. Then it was, okay, if you could prove it, we'll turn them over to Pakistan. And then obviously that's the same thing as turning them over to the Americans anyway, right? right. The same thing with turning them over to any Muslim country means mm -hmm. Egypt or mm -hmm. anywhere that would have renditioned him right to the U.S. or right to the deepest dungeon or whatever, um, any American pup state. Then... Once the bombs started falling, it's true, this is after the bombs started falling in the beginning of October, like October 8th, they said, okay, we'll turn him over to any country in the world other than the United States and with no demand for evidence of his guilt whatsoever. And Bush said, no, fuck you, that's it, and kept the bombing going, kept the war going. And then, and then when they started the war, the first thing they did was go and attack the Taliban and all the Taliban positions in the north for the benefit of the Northern Alliance, mm -hmm. while Osama bin Laden and all his friends were escaping from the Nangarhar province in the far east of the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I make the case in the book, and I think it's pretty clear that they deliberately decided to let bin Laden go so that mm -hmm. they would have that enemy out there, that they would rather have the enemy live so that they could keep people's moms scared and keep everybody, get everybody, you know, keep them upset and have ready the, for, the the next war. for the next war. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, so then I argue that, okay, look, even if you say, I don't want bin Laden on trial, I wanted some carpet bombing. I was so mad about 9-11, I want Al-Qaeda dead. Then I argue, okay, but you didn't have to attack the Taliban. The mm -hmm. Taliban would have just stood out of the way. We didn't have to have a regime change in Kabul. We didn't have to take the side of the Northern Alliance. They, could have, they already had enough Rangers and Delta guys on the ground, and CIA special operator, uh, uh, special action team guys, whatever, on the ground that... Uh, 
And the Taliban had already made it clear that at that point they were just going to stand back. They weren't going to help Osama. If America was just targeting Osama, they weren't going to do anything. And in fact, in the book, I talk about uh, how one Taliban commander on the Shamali plane was surrendering to an American CIA officer who was just calling in airstrikes. He didn't even have foot soldiers. He was just calling in airstrikes. And the uh, uh, battalion or whatever division of Taliban was surrendering and the commander was surrendering and he said so what are your demands and the Americans said if you have any Arabs with you kill them and the guy says hang on and you hear pow, 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 in the back that's it and the Taliban took all the Arabs fighters that were with them put them up against the wall and executed them and said okay I did what you wanted I'm ready to turn over my local guys to you know surrender so they were perfectly willing to sacrifice Al-Qaeda. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, Bush and them at the time, if you remember at the time, they did everything in the world to make you confuse the two. And, oh, yeah. and yeah, so I that you would that not era. understand that. Uh -huh. Al-Qaeda is this band of pirates, this group of outlaws, mostly exiled uh -huh. from Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which is far from Afghanistan. Uh -huh. And they're hiding out here and they're imposing themselves, essentially, on the local government there, which has let them stay. But... Boy, even to explain it that far, and you see the opportunity for negotiation right there. Mm -hmm. How can I divide this group of criminals away from the leaders of the state where they live? But that wasn't the answers that they were, that wasn't the question they were asking or the answers that they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So then I argue, okay, even if you say, yeah, but you know what? The Taliban let Osama live there since 1996. Mm -hmm. So I say bomb them too. I don't give a damn because that's how mad I am about 9-11. Then I say, okay, fine. Even if you think that. That still doesn't mean that you have to install a new government in power and swear that all its enemies are your enemies until the end of time. And in fact, in this situation, take the side of a coalition of small minority groups, 10 and 20 percent of the population each, against the plurality, 40 percent of the population, the Pashtuns, who are mountain men with rifles, who like to fight and who will not give up, and they never have. I mean, when Tamer Lane came through there, they fought him, mm -hmm. you know? They fought everyone, and they made it clear this whole time, and it's been obvious this whole time, and not just to say, I told you so, because uh, look at how great I am, but that anyone who was being honest about this and critical about this, like myself, could have told you in September of 2001, America's going to lose the Afghan war. It's a country the size of Texas, which is huge, it is. From the middle of Texas to El Paso, from Austin to El Paso, is halfway to California. That's just half of Texas, is halfway to California. That's how big Texas is. That's why they say everything big in Texas. It actually is because big it, as like five of the other neighboring states, okay? Yeah. It's friggin' huge. That's how big Afghanistan is. And it has mountains like Colorado and deserts like California and Arizona. It's completely landlocked. You, you can't get there from the sea at all. And in fact, there's only one country, Pakistan, between Afghanistan and the sea. But guess what? There's a mountain range between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So to even get your trucks from your boat into Afghanistan means you have to go all the way up into the Khyber Pass and back down again. Okay? I said so in September 2001. America will lose this war. Simple as that. And, and a lot of other people did too. Yeah. This yeah. is the dumbest thing in the world to do. It'd be, you know what? The Afghans would be just as smart to try to invade and take Texas away from me. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. Simple as that. And so that was the way I, I tried to do it in the book. And, and in fact, you know, what's really sad about this is that when the war started, the Taliban, they left the field. They did not say this will be the mother of all battles. And, or even, they didn't even retreat in order to resort to guerrilla war. Uh -huh. They surrendered. They quit. And Mullah Omar, their leader, authorized his entire cabinet to surrender and submit to the authority. And, and they cleverly appointed Hamid Karzai, who was a Pashtun, whose father had been an important tribal chief from Kandahar province. Mm -hmm. So when they installed him as the president, the Taliban said, you know what? He's Islamic. He's Pashtun. He's legitimate. He's good enough for us. That was the government we just overthrew. <laughs> Said, we will recognize the authority of the new government. We don't give a damn. Mullah Omar didn't want to be the dictator or nothing anyway. Mm -hmm. He went home to study. And, and, um, and so it took essentially four years, four and a half, five years, for the Americans to pick a fight with the Pashtun population so bad that now they couldn't win it. 
and now once this insurgency that they had you know essentially created with their further adventurism in the country was out of control yeah. and you know the from Haqqani and Hekmatyar and the most powerful of uh, the Taliban leaders these were all guys who had previous relationships with the US all guys that we could have worked with you yeah. know the Haqqani, uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani who is the, the leader of the second biggest anti-American faction there fighting with the Afghan Taliban against the Americans there. He worked for the CIA and he tried to surrender. It's in the book. He tried to surrender over and over again. It wasn't until they finally tortured, kidnapped and tortured his brother. Oh, the CIA hired his brother and said, okay, you can run a counterterrorism pursuit team and hunt down some guys for us. And then the military captured him and tortured him anyway. And the CIA didn't spring him. They just left him. And so only then did Jalaluddin Haqqani become this, you know, he already was an insane killer, I guess, but only at that point did he become an enemy of the Americans and the American installed government and proceed to kill untold tens of thousands of people since then. His son is now the military commander of the Afghan Taliban, so they've merged their groups together. That was completely an American-created catastrophe after the war. You know, this is in 2003 or four was when he finally gave up trying to reconcile. So... It's a bad one. All right. Well, I appreciate it. I, I was really impressed with the book, and I, I hope everybody listening goes out and buys it. It's an audio book, too, so if you think you can listen to me talk for nine hours uh, we're, we're, about uh, one thing. We're coming up on it. Which, yeah, there you go. It's um, going to be just like this, kind of. <laughs> um, is there uh, anything else that you'd like to promote um, your upcoming book, websites, projects? Um, let's see. So the book is Fool's Aaron. The website is scotthorton.org for the interviews. Libertarian Institute is the institute, antiwar.com for all the stuff I want you to read. And um, I guess I have a YouTube channel if people prefer getting their interviews that way. And I have some speeches on there if people want to see that. Yeah, it's and, available on iTunes as well. Right. right. Yeah. And then for any, anyone in your audience who lives in L.A., I'm on Sunday mornings, uh, 8.30 on KPFK 90.7. Oh, cool. All right. And I think that's it. And I got a new book coming out hopefully by the end of the summer. All right. Excellent, Scott. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank we really you. appreciate it. Hell yeah. It was a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Me too. <laughs> All right. All right. Wow. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. that, was, that was something. I, uh, I'm glad we got him talking about like, just real political stuff. I imagine this is kind of inside baseball for a lot of you, but um, it, was, it was certainly interesting for us. And as far as the war stuff is concerned... I didn't understand a lot of this before I started listening to Scott Horton. The first time I heard Scott Horton on a podcast, I was like, wow, who is this guy? And and went and tracked him down. And um, I, I've gotten some positive comments of, about some of my commentary on this podcast, on the Liberty Mike, about foreign policy stuff. And I have to give credit where it's due that most of what I know and understand about foreign policy at this point is at least partially the result of Scott Horton's efforts. I get a yeah. ton of information from the sites that he runs. Absolutely. Uh, other than that, like I say, I mean, I, I will like to say that um, on top of being just a wealth of knowledge, Scott Horton is just a fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's cool. I'm, I'm glad that that, yeah. that that turned out to be, uh, I'm glad that turned out to be the case. Yeah, it was, it was really a blast, so... So um, I hope you guys enjoyed that again as much as we enjoyed doing it. Um, hopefully we can get more content like this. If, uh, if you enjoyed it, if you were fascinated by what he had to say, check out his stuff. Uh, I, I plugged it at the beginning of the interview, and, and he told you where you can find him at the end. Seek him out. Do it. It's, it's definitely worth it. I mean, you'll be a smarter person because of it. Yeah. Um, you'll certainly understand a whole lot more about what's going on in the world. Absolutely. And uh, if you don't want to get into all of it, you can pick and choose the, the um, interviews. Antiwar.com, that's an everyday visit. Yeah. The, you got you to gotta know what's, what's going on here. This is, um, I, and I, I don't think I can give credit to Scott Horton on this, but I used to believe that the most important thing that we had to focus on as libertarians was economic policy. Uh, you know, in the Fed and, and all that all that kind of thing. Um, I have come to realize that most of what we complain about, these infringements on our on our civil liberties, 
uh, the cost of our government generally, almost everything that we would like to change has its roots in our um, in the war state, in the warfare state. Yep. And so that has certainly become my big issue is American foreign policy is the real problem. And if we can rein it in and move to an, uh, a non-interventionist policy, if we can concern ourselves with our own national defense and like truly our national defense. True defense. Um, and nothing more that we would be much better off in a whole lot of areas. Um, I think that it was John Adams that said, uh, if tyranny and oppression come to this land, it will be in the guise of fighting a foreign enemy. And I, we've certainly seen that through since 9-11 and before, oh, really. Really, but, before then. I mean, it's, it's, it's been happening for a while. But this, is, uh, this has been the excuse. The terror war has been the excuse to strip away liberty after liberty that, that yep. is, was enshrined in our Constitution and um, pre-existed that. So, yep. uh, so uh, again, hope you enjoyed it. Certainly let us know. Um, you know, follow Scott if uh, if you liked it, and I don't know how you could have not. And uh, we will catch you again real soon um, to talk about the First Amendment. I think is our plan. Uh, we were going to talk about Brexit, actually. I I didn't put that on the agenda because I realized that there was no way that was actually going to happen on March 29th <laughs> when they had their deadline. Yeah. Uh, so it has been moved back two weeks. We got a couple more weeks before they uh, probably move it back again. Yeah, in all likelihood. <laughs> yeah. So we will catch you next time. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Um, you can subscribe to us on iTunes. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, any comments or criticisms or attaboys. <laughs> we, we like those too. So everyone, I hope you have a great night. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Ciao. Later.